Luke 17, let's stand for a moment if you're able to do so out of respect for God's Word. We're going to begin in verse 11 and read down through verse 19. Luke chapter 17, and let's begin in verse number 11. And it came to pass as he, Christ, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Verse 13, they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, verse 15, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, We're not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And so we began a series of probably about a month and a half or so ago, and then with several special Sundays we've taken a break, but we're resuming tonight, Route G, the route of gratitude, going with gratitude. And tonight we'll look at the value of grateful review. Just revisiting where God has been good and letting Him know that we appreciate it. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for the joy it is to be here tonight. Thank You for what You've done in our lives to this point. Um, Lord, this past week just is saturated with Your goodness if we take the time to think on it, let alone a month, a year, a decade, several decades, Lord, as we look back just to see Your hand of goodness. And forgive us, God, when we fail to review properly and to revisit those moments where you have proved yourself good and faithful, and to help us, Lord, to tap into the potential of those moments, again, anew and afresh, by revisiting them with worship and with gratitude. Bless our study tonight, um, uproot where we are ungrateful, and Lord, plant deeply a spirit of gratitude in each of our hearts that would translate to action this week. And we will thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, as we talk about remembering or reviewing, how many of you, your, your memory scares you a bit? Um, and not scares you as in, whoa, I'm just amazingly sharp. Uh, it's it's uh, usually the opposite. I'm dull as a, a hoe and I can't remember anything and, uh, and trying to remember things. Uh, this morning, uh, my last couple of weeks have been less than normal schedule. And I was telling Heidi after church this morning, normally Saturday nights I have trouble sleeping because... I'm just gearing up for Sunday. That's kind of the, I'm pushing every week towards Sunday. And just with the schedule being different, I woke up this morning several times. I had several alarm clocks set, thankfully. I had no clue where I was at, what day of the week it was, what I was supposed to do today, which is very abnormal for me. But my, just my brain, just my memory, it, it really concerns me. Um, the other day I was reading an article talking about the five uh, types of memory that we all at least should have. Um, and I thought there was a bit of truth tucked into the list. The first type of memory would be short-term, which is actually the one that scares me the most in my own life. Actually, everything I should remember seems short-term. It comes and goes. Uh, but these would be things like how we, uh, information we use to talk, think, and act. A lot of times those things are coming in and out of our brains regularly. Uh, the second group or category was episodal. Uh, this would be... Um, uh, your memory's response to questions like, what did you do last weekend? Um, maybe the first time you saw snow, uh, first time you jumped in the ocean, those kind of moments where there was an episode that just sticks in your mind. And the more uh, emotionally engaging that memory, the more your mind is able to recall it. Uh, the third category would be long-term. This would be facts, things that come from your brain, like what's the capital of you know whatever state or what's whatever a math figure that your brain you don't even remember where you learned it but you at least most of the time come up with the right answer uh, the fourth one would be semantic um, this would be general knowledge uh, type of things things that are just kind of routine that we're familiar with such as verbal things utterances and then the last one that was interesting was the category of procedural um, and this would be something I don't know if you've ever amazed yourself uh, with things you remember such as like riding a bike it's really funny if you think about it. I mean, I, ha I, don't, I can't remember the last time I've ridden a bike. Usually I ride one a couple times a year that your body can remember how to balance. And some of those procedural things just come back to you. But some of them do not without practice. 
Um, I've noticed with our musicians, they don't just practice right before they perform. They have to constantly keep things fresh to stay agile and, and skillful. Same thing with language. Um, you can learn a language, and if you don't use it, um, it can very quickly dissipate from your mind. And in the area of gratitude, I think some of it we treat like it's just kind of there, and God knows, and I know. And we've had some moments of worship and gratitude, but, but I would submit to you, gratitude is something either you use it or you lose it. And I want to just spend a few minutes tonight trying to help you maybe develop the habit. We're not talking about one time you need to review or revisit what God has done, but getting used to regularly reviewing, reviewing in your heart and mind how good God has been in your life. And if you were to ask me, what is the most graphic illustration of ingratitude in Scripture? I think we all would agree this is at least on the top five, if not number one in the Scripture. How ugly ingratitude looks, the, the shame of it, the awkward silence that followed Christ's question, where are the nine? And so I think there's some things we can learn from this gentleman who was grateful that can help keep it fresh in our hearts and lives as well. And so if you're taking notes tonight, our outline's on the back of your bulletin. Let's talk for a few minutes about two healing memories that if we go with gratitude in our day-to-day and we decide to be grateful, that these memories will heal us and continue to heal us and to restore us in our relationship uh, with the Lord. Number one, first of all, let's talk for a few minutes about this first uh, memory that we need to daily and regularly review, and that is review what Christ can heal when you gratefully submit. Key truth tonight, um, ingratitude ultimately is insurrection. Ingratitude ultimately is insurrection. It is you take issue with God, specifically with the Lord, what He's allowed in your life or what He didn't allow in your life, and it's a matter of resistance as much as it is rejoicing. And may I say tonight, we're, as, we're grateful in proportion to how much Christ is Lord in our lives. If He is in control, if we are in submission to Him, there's a direct correlation between in step with Him and in yieldedness to Him and the gratitude that fills our heart. And also a couple areas of submission that these men uh, were willing to commit to that led to uh, what should have been great gratitude in their hearts. Look, if you will, at verse number 12. And as he entered, excuse me, into a certain village, there met him ten lepers that were uh, ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, "Jesus, notice this, Master, have mercy on us." Number one, we need to submit to the Lord with grateful request. Grateful request, and I'm talking specifically about things that we ask God for in the past. Uh, Men, for just a minute, go back to those few seconds right before you ask your wife to marry you. Um, And though hopefully you knew the answer to that question, if you've had that privilege, there was still that, that moment of vulnerability, that moment of I'm putting it all on the line, what will she say? Maybe you got shot down the first few times, I don't know, but I'll assume for your benefit that they did not. Uh, They responded in a positive way. Um, Remember the last time you were in crisis and you desperately cried out to God, your child was moments from death, or you were in the midst of a traffic whatever in front of you and God delivered you, whatever the last moment of desperation, and God heard your request. Uh, These men uh, forgot the desperation. They forgot how much they needed God to enter into their situation that, again, was so desperate. By the way, in verse number 12 is God's mercy when it says, He passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. He went close enough to Samaria for a reason, didn't he? The man later on in the story, the only one who was grateful was of what ethnicity? He was a Samaritan. Um, God came near enough to hear this man's request and to respond with healing and with grace and with mercy. May I submit to you tonight, too often we don't feel gratitude now because we've forgotten how desperate we used to be for God to get involved in our lives. Um, I love to be around new believers. In some ways, it's shaming to me how little I appreciate my salvation when I'm in their presence, but it's fresh to them, isn't it? They literally were one breath away from hell, and God entered into their life and redeemed them, and they're so overwhelmed with gratitude. Have you noticed, as I have, as the years click by and maybe the decades click by since you were a believer, that that wanes, that it's not quite as precious as it used to be? We need to review where God has responded to a request of desperation that we ask. Um, And so we need to work at that and return to that on a regular basis. Go back to when you had nothing. Go back to when you needed God. 
and review how good He was to you in those moments and let that stir and, and, and warm the embers in your heart of gratitude toward the Lord. All right, then if you would, notice what Christ did in response to that request. Verse 14, and when He saw them, He said unto them, Go, you show yourselves unto the priest. Notice the end of this verse. And it came to pass, I would underline this phrase if you do so in your Bible, and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. Number two, we need to submit with a grateful response. Submit with a grateful request. Number two, submit to God with a grateful response. Um, Yesterday uh, was May the 6th and was the 44th uh, graduation for ATI here in, in our city. Um, what's significant about that, I can't believe it's been 44 years, is my own father, uh, my dad who's been there a few times, here a few times, he was in the first graduating ca- class of ATI. Um, it's amazing to me as I look back on my dad and some of the choices that he made. He worked on a dairy farm in Loudonville. That's how I ended up being born here in Worcester. At Worcester Community Hospital, uh, he worked at Astro Metallurgical. If you know Ron or uh, Roger Murray, he was a VP there for a while. Um, Dad worked there for a number of years, and a lot of his choices have really brought me full circle back to this city. I never lived here as far as my growing up years, but even though Dad made some moves that I think God used to bring me to this city and to have a small part in what God's doing in our church here, I still had a choice to make in that. And here's the thought tonight: before we move on. Everything that we do between us and God involves not just attitude, but action. Here's a thought tonight I would give you. How do you view gratitude? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I tend to view it as an attitude. It's kind of like a heart position, and I think that is true, but it also is a practice, is it not? Here's a thought for you to think about tonight, those of you who think you've arrived or you have no major issue in this area of gratitude. When's the last time you've asked yourself this question, what would a grateful person do right now? Not how would they feel, what would they do? If we were to go back through this last week, what tangible markers are in your life and in mind that show you're grateful? I think we give a lot of lip surface. We kind of bottle up the, the issues we have with God. What are we doing that's demonstrating our gratitude? These men, God moved in their life because they did something. They responded to God's prompting uh, in their life. And here's just a thought tonight. If your relationship with Christ did not begin with passivity and apathy, it cannot continue with that same kind of apathy. Uh, it must be refined, it must be re-engaged, it must be fueled with and driven by gratitude that results in action. See, gratitude is not just an attitude, it is an action. And here's a statement I would give you tonight that maybe will help you, because I, if you're like me, you don't feel grateful sometimes. You feel frustrated, you feel overwhelmed, you feel, et cetera, et cetera, negative emotions. But here's a statement that has helped me. Motion, jot this down, motion leads to emotion. Motion leads to emotion. And I have found when I'm not grateful, if I wait until I feel grateful, I'll never get around to doing or being grateful. But if I'll do something that is synonymous with a grateful heart, and I'll even almost not force myself in a hypocrisy type of way, but I just put motion before emotion, the emotion of gratitude tends to kick in as I honor the Lord. Let me give you a quick example of this, how our submission to God Uh, renews our sense of gratitude. Go back to the book of Psalms, to Psalm 100. And this word jumped out at me. I've probably quoted this psalm more thanksgivings than I've not. Uh, I've I've memorized the psalm. I've, I've referenced it. I've preached from it. But I don't know that I've ever seen the connection between submission and gratitude in the same way that I have in light of our study this evening. Look at Psalm 100 and see if you can pick up the word that God connects here in this psalm, the psalmist connects in this, in this psalm to gratitude before uh, the Lord. Psalm 100, verse 1, Make a joyful noise in the Lord, all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, that would tie in with our study this morning, and not we ourselves. We are His people, the she- <laughs> excuse me, the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Verse 5, for the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Do you notice a word that recurs over and over in Psalm 100? Did you catch it? It starts with the letter L, Lord. 
Lord, Lord. Where we have issue in gratitude really is less about circumstances. It's less about us having a list of counting our blessings kind of thing. And it's more about we're not submitted to the Lord. Um, These men, why God worked in their life to begin with was they called out to God and then they believed and they responded to what God revealed to them. And the same is true of us. We must submit to God in gratitude. And as we do so, this gratitude is renewed. This gratitude is refreshed. I'll just put this little point in and we'll move to our second point tonight. Many of you, starting with me, many of us, our issue with God is God is not being God in our life the way we want Him to. And because we are not willing to submit to who He is in our life, we're never going to get to the point that we're grateful. We're all, let's be honest, a bit of a control freak, are we not? We want to control the narrative and the plot and the characters in the last chapter, and we have no right to do so. He is sovereign. He is Lord. To be grateful, we must submit ourselves to Him. All right, now if you will, go back to our text in Luke 17, and notice now the the really convicting part of this story, beginning in verse number 15. Notice one of them, verse 15, remember back in verse number 12, it says there were 10 total that were together, and one of them, one of these 10, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, (laughs) excuse me, giving him thanks. All right, number two, we need to review not only with grateful submission, but number two, we need to review what Christ can do when we are gratefully uh, worshiping Him. So we submit to Him. Number two, we must uh, be willing to worship Him. Um, I'm amazed. I watch or read a bit on sports and follow that a bit in my my spare time, and uh, my boys are into that. And I'm always amazed at the end of a sporting event, they'll, right away, while there's still sweat dripping from the athlete, they'll put a mic in the face of that person, whether they just lost or won, and they'll try to get their initial response. Have you noticed that when it comes to sports, they all say the same kind of things? They're like the most trite expressions, you know? Um, and uh, I, it's just the same thing over and over again. One of the things I hear often in sports is we need to go to the next level. Uh, we as a team, we need to go to the next level. I remember sitting in football locker rooms and basketball locker rooms and hearing coaches say that. You're, you're being complacent. We need to go to the next level. Here's just a thought tonight that I think will help you. To go to the next level spiritually, here's the thought, is when you get to the point that you worship God by choice in gratitude, when you spend the lion's share of your time worshiping God for how good He has been, not asking Him to do more and to be more, but just worshiping Him for what He has done and who He is. And we see that clearly in the story. The gap between the nine and the one is the fact that one of them chose to worship and not just respond in a self-interest. All right, notice a few things about this man. Number one, first of all, in verse 16, you will notice, it says, and fell down on his feet, uh, on his face, at his feet, giving him thanks. Number one, first of all, we need to worship with a grateful face. With a grateful face. The other day, I was reading an article by a dear senior uh, lady who's a great writer, and uh, she made a statement, one of the things on her list that she tries to do every day, she had a list, several, that were very convicting to me and challenging to me. She said this, one of the things on her list, quote, pay attention to your resting face. Watch what your face says. I don't know that we think about our facial expressions. Um, when no one's watching, when, when you're not conversing with one, anyone else, what does God see? What, what's your face? Here's a truth tonight that I think we need to really think on. You're grateful or ungrateful, not because of the circumstances in your life, but to what you face, what you focus on. If you notice certain people, when you ask them how they're doing, they always find something negative, no matter how good things are going. And other people, no matter how bad it's going, they always find something good to say. I get so tired of, well, you know, I'm doing all right. You know, just, they won't say anything real negative, but there's just that, it's just under the surface. Where is our face tonight? What are we focused on? What are we looking at? This man had his face in the right direction. 
before running off at a dead sprint to do all the things he had been missing during his years as an outcast. Imagine how long that list was. He took the time to face Christ, to come and fall before him and worship him in a way that honored and pleased the Lord. All right, stay with me tonight. Have you noticed that in our lives, God, when he blesses, that Satan still shows up? The other day I read a quote, someone said, when Satan tempts, God is always present. That's an encouraging thing. Just as when God blesses, Satan is never absent. And often in our blessings, if we're not careful, we're distracted. Our face begins to look away, and we're not focused where God would have us to be focused, and that is in worship and in gratitude to Him. I want to give you tonight, they're not on the slides, but can I give you a few things that set us up for failure that we often face, that we live our lives facing, and I think always trip us up from being what God would have us to be in this area of gratitude. Jot down these few things. Number one, unrealistic expectations. All right, these are a few just practical things I would give you tonight to be careful to face away from. Number one, unrealistic expectations. Have you ever caught yourself starting to expect a lot out of life that you don't deserve? Um, I don't deserve to ever get cut off in traffic. I don't ever deserve to be misunderstood at work. I don't ever deserve to have a difficult marital relationship or child-parent relationship. And we feel like we're entitled when almost all of those things, I would submit to you, all of them are blessings that we don't deserve. And we expect things to be perfect, and we have no foundation to do so. We live in a sin-cursed world. We live with all kinds of frustrations and inconveniences, and it's just part of our day-to-day. And because of these unrealistic expectations, we set ourselves up for ingratitude. What about if we went into every day expecting, and I don't mean this in a pessimistic way, but we expect to have difficulty. Wouldn't that change how we view them when they come and having a right spirit and attitude and outlook? Unrealistic expectations. All right, number two, jot this down, forgetfulness. And this would kind of line in with our study tonight, forgetfulness. I believe forgetfulness and ingratitude always go hand in hand. Wherever you find forgetfulness, you find ingratitude. The one who is always reviewing God's goodness is always the individual that has gratitude. Hold your place there in Luke 17. Would you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 8, for just a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 8 in verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 19. And there's a verse here. The whole book of Deuteronomy is what is the purpose of Deuteronomy? To remember It's just a repetition of the same law God had given back in Exodus. He's reviewing these things to the nation of Israel. Um, There's this new generation, and he's reminding them to remember, remember, remember. Look, if you will, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 19. And it shall be, if uh, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God... Forget and all and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. Notice that and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Ye shall sh- uh, surely perish. And the idea here is that it's it's almost as if in our lives when we forget how good God has been, we die a little every day. We forget how good God has been, and we lose another day. We could have been more for the Lord. We could have thrived and flourished and been more pleasing and honoring to Him. And when we are forgetful, we miss out on all that God has promised. Instead of the abundant life, we perish. Do you remember tonight how good God has been to you? All right, thirdly, jot down a third one, an attitude and a position of our face that often is off. Thirdly, entitlement. Entitlement. Unrealistic expectations, forgetfulness, thirdly, entitlement. Um, I don't know what your favorite um, form of chicken is. Uh, I have several preferences. They all typically are served at Chick-fil-A if I'm talking about fast food type of chicken. I love Chick-fil-A. The other day, a friend of mine said, he posted this. He said, quote, dear Chick-fil-A, how many nuggets from a platter is equal to one sandwich? I hope the answer is 40 because that's what I'm operating off of. That, that was his, his parallel, 40 chicken nuggets. If you've ever had chicken nuggets at Chick-fil-A, they're not your typical Newcomb kind of version. They're, they're great. And he said 40 is equal to a sandwich. We're so, we're so wanting our own thing and feeding our own flesh and getting as much as we can. And when we take simple blessings for granted as if they're owed to us, 
or conversely, the things we have are not what we truly deserve. Ingratitude thrives in that environment. It thrives in that heart. It thrives in that home. And one of the concerns I have are the little eyes that hear me express ingratitude and ears, and they see it in me, and their standard of what we deserve and what we're entitled to is is skewed because of my own ingratitude. One author said this, the more affluent we are, the higher our standard of living, it seems, the more demanding and discontented we become. Be careful where you place the bar for what you can and can't live with or without. The height of that baseline affects just about everything. What's your baseline tonight? What do you deserve? And every time it dips below that, woe is me. I don't have what I deserve. We don't deserve anything less than hell. We don't deserve anything less than eternity without the Lord. Get rid of the entitlement. Let gratitude be what displaces it. All right, and then the last one. Well, two more here. Comparison. Comparison. I found if we're not focused on what we don't have or what we should have, we're focused on what others have and what we rightfully should have in comparison to that. 2 Corinthians, would you go there for a moment in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, and you can meditate on this whole passage later on your own time, but 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and if you would please, verse number 12. And I think we get off on this one, we face others. I don't know if you fall into this, but I know I do in my line of work and in my my day-to-day, I look at others that have more or in the negative things have less than I do. And you may be tempted to do that as a result, ingratitude is creeping in. Look in here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. He says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Skip, if you will, then down to verse 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And here's just a thought tonight, because I think we struggle with this in the work setting, we struggle with this in the family setting. Horizontal comparison gets our eyes off of the Lord. And we don't have time to give Him gratitude because we're comparing ourselves with our co-workers, we're comparing ourselves with our spouse, we're comparing ourselves with our siblings, we're comparing ourselves with our neighbors. As a result, God is not getting glory from our lives. And here's just a thought tonight. No matter what's happening in other people's lives, you will answer for your outlook about what's going on in your life. Someday, listen, it's just going to be you and God, the God who's been so good to you, the God who has been so gracious to you. And someday it'll just be you and Him. And gratitude prepares us for that moment. Get your eyes off of others. Keep your eyes upon the Lord. All right, and then the last one, if you jot this down, is blindness to God's grace. These are five things that our face gets distracted by unrealistic expectations, forgetfulness, entitlement, comparison, and then fifthly, uh, blindness to God's grace. We are debtors to God. God does not owe us anything, and it is only by His grace that we have any goodness in our life. I love the example of Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 where he says, And last of all, you have seen of me also as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles. They am not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul never got over how much he didn't deserve God's grace. And that gratitude and that worship sustained him through difficult seasons of life. Lastly, let's spend a few minutes back in our text. Notice now Christ's reaction to this man. Would you go back there? Go back to Luke 17, and notice verse number 16. And I love this, the end of verse 16. So we find this man, he's healed, he comes back alone to the Lord, he's on his face at the feet of Christ giving thanks. Notice, and he was a Samaritan, and Jesus answering said, we're not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Uh, Secondly, and lastly, we worship God not only with a grateful face, but number two, with a grateful faith. With a grateful faith. How many of you are Kentucky Derby watcher people? Would you raise your hands for a minute? Some of you, you only watch for the styles or the hats or the whatever. Um, yesterday, we got back and we were kind of regrouping from our last trip, and so we watched that. Um, what was the name of the winning horse? Anybody remember? Always dreaming, right? 
Um, gratitude works in harmony with faith. A heart that is grateful uh, is a heart that exhibits great faith. A heart that is ungrateful does not exhibit faith that honors the Lord. And we see clearly the gratitude in this man's heart gave him faith to put faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Only one of the ten was grateful enough to come back. And God blessed and worked in his life in a special way. Now, here's just a thought before we move on. Why did the other nine not come back? Have you ever thought about that? Um, we don't know their names, but I guarantee they regretted that, if not in this life, when this life was done. Do you think it was maybe, it wasn't that Christ was not important, it's just that he wasn't as important as other things? Imagine just their wives and, and, and their kids and maybe grandkids they had never seen, and they had been ostracized for years, many of them, and, and can we really fault them for that? Can I just say tonight that ingratitude rarely is a callous, kind of flippant view of God. It's just we don't put God first on the list, and these men, I believe, fell into that category. One of them, though, was willing to come back and to respond to God's work in his life with faith. And notice Christ commends that. Look at verse 19. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. The other men received physical deliverance, right? They received physical healing. Only one of them was saved. Um, and gratitude in this man's heart is the difference between nine men who for a few years received cleansing on a physical level of leprosy and one that right now tonight is with the Lord. They went back to their houses and enjoyed renewal and communion with their wives and kids and grandbabies, and they had that initial reunion, but then they still perished. This man tonight is with the Lord, and the difference between those two categories is just one word, one heart position, and that's the word gratitude. The greatest issue with our faith, I believe tonight, is not how we look forward, but how we look backwards. Why we're so weak in faith is not because we don't have a vision for the future, it's that we don't have a proper view of how good God's been to us in the past. Many of you, much more seasoned than I, you could attest to how great God is, and you can go back year after year and celebrate and recall how faithful He's been, and some of us a little less mature spiritually have yet to learn that habit. And so the greatest issue with our faith, I repeat it, is not how we look forward, but it's how we look backwards how good God has been, and how that reveals how powerful and the potential that we find in Him. Can I give you a statement to John Down tonight that convicted me when I read it? I don't like the statement, but it's true. Here's the statement. Unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. Unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. And if you are not expressing your gratitude by saying, God, I submit to you, and I worship you, you're ungrateful, and so am I. But when you say, God, you are Lord, and I submit to everything going on in my life, and blessed be the name of God, and you worship Him and you praise Him, in that moment is gratitude. When you submit to Him and when you worship Him, even in difficult times, God gets glory from that. Unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. With some of my counseling prep for my uh, degree that I just finished, I read recently an article by a gentleman named Paul, Dave, Paul David Tripp, and he recalled a scene where he was in uh, India, uh, and uh, as he was traveling through that region of our world, he came across a situation that he had experienced in the past, but this time it struck him more deeply than previously. He was passing through New Delhi there in one of the most horrible slums in the world. He stood transfixed before a three-year-old boy leaning against the cot of his ailing and perhaps dying mother. The boy's eyes were hollow, his stomach distended, his face fly-infested, the very picture of massive, helpless, noxious poverty. The tears that streamed down Paul's cheeks in observing this tragedy were indeed a heartfelt evidence of his compassion. He longed to sweep this boy and his mother into his arms away from the dreaded depths of sorrow and the endless need that was before them. But he said it was more than mere compassion. He felt it was an awareness that neither he nor this little boy had chosen their circumstances in life. 
the blessings of being raised, by, uh, uh, raised among plenty, nurtured by godly parents, educated in quality schools, and given over to Christ at a young age began to rule o- roll over him in waves, even as he did his best to comfort and console the needy pair before him. And then he made this statement. Listen to this. He said, you cannot explain the difference between that little boy and me by anything other than the Lord. Anything good going on in our lives today, anything that has gone on good in our lives, it's only because of the Lord. It's not because of us. And there are people all over the globe that would love to have the history we have with God. And yet we have it and we're not grateful for it. We don't submit to that God. We don't worship that God. The question I would ask as we finish tonight is, will you draw closer to the gratitude God wants in your heart by reviewing how the Lord has blessed you as you've gratefully submitted to Him, how He will bless you as you gratefully worship Him with your life? I end again with that statement, unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. Will you express it with submission and with worship? Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your goodness in our lives. Lord, ingratitude is so ugly.